Welcome to our case study go through. Um, the first case study is related to Michelle and Co. So we're going to be applying the ISA to 10, agreeing the terms of engagement, uh, of all the engagement. Okay, so let me take you back here. Agreeing the terms of all the engagements, the factors to be considered here, and we're going to be applying that to the case study. Now, we are given 10 marks here, so, uh, uh, sorry, it's the 12 marks here, but uh, we are not required to write 12 points for that, so I will uh, write approximately a maximum of 6 points uh, related to this requirement. So we're going to be assessing the professional, ethical and other issues to be considered in deciding whether or not to proceed with the appointment as an auditor of, of the MEDIS complaint. So in other words, we are considering the factors to be considered according to ISA 210, okay, related to it. So, for example, whether or not we can do the audit, whether or not we are willing to do the audit, we can consider the issues and reputation of a client. Okay, so these are four points that we, I, I can write out in my exam and, 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 and to apply to the case and also consider the ethics side. Uh, um, so that would be the fifth point anyway. So uh, let's look at the case first of all then. So of, of course you notice the word is called assess, so therefore we'll be using a four steps approach here. You are a senior audit manager in Michelle and Co. is the firm of Charter Certified Accountants. You're reviewing some information regarding a potential new audit clients. Okay, so that's new. So therefore you will need to consider the opening balance of the client's financial statement and therefore you may need to devote more time and effort in checking the financial statements in some way. The audit client is called Medis completes the supply of medical instrument and we've got the extract from notes taken at a meeting that you recently held with the finance director as shown in the exhibit number one and after re receiving the permission from Medis complete you held a discussion with the current audit partner Mick Kivant, who runs a small accounting and audit practice, which he is one of two partners, and Mick made the comments in exhibit number two, and extract from the press release is included in the exhibit number three. So, therefore, we're going to be include, uh, we're going to be reviewing that information in the exhibit one and two, okay, uh, because uh, the current audit partner. So, in other words. We are the incoming auditor. And therefore it seems that we are communicating with the previous auditor or the predecessor auditor, in other words, it's called professional clearance procedure. So in other words, we need to communicate with the predecessor auditor and to assess whether or not there are any factors that we should not be accepting as an auditor for this particular audit kind. Of course, finally, we can give a conclusion for that of whether or not we should accept as an auditor. Of course, professional clearance procedures should be done before you plan the audit because the professional clearance procedure we need to determine whether or not you will sign the contract, which means the audit engagement with the client's company. Okay then, so uh, we're going to be using a four steps approach, as you can see in your answer. First of all, tutorial notes. First of all, what and a conscious standard and whether or not this is followed and why implications and how to improve as a step number four. Okay, so, uh, so let's see the exhibit first of all. So let's see the exhibit number one then. Medis company is a provider of specialised surgical instruments used in medical procedures. So it says providing specialised inventories and therefore expertise may need to be applied here. So expertise in terms of your audit staff, whether or not you've got the expertise in providing uh, that audit services and that could be, that should be considered. The company is only managed and it's a financial year ending, 30th June, 
and has invited our firm to be appointed as an auditor for a forthcoming year event. So it's like the tentative document, in other words, we're going to submit. The audit is not going out to tender. Oh, okay, not going out to tender. Oh, that's fine now. So uh, Ricardo has been with the company since January following the departure of the previous finance director, who has taken legal action against the Medis company for unfair dismissal. So it seems that the management style that the clients' companies communicating with the internal employees will be quite a bit aggressive, okay? So because unfair dismissal, this is quite serious indeed. So, um, so we are afraid that after we accept as an auditor, so if um, they are not paying for us, or they are limiting on uh, our scope on audit, which means are not allowing us to check this area or that area, uh, we may face the similar situation as a result. So uh, we need to care, consider about that very carefully. And now it's the last month of the financial year. Okay, so, um, so in other words, uh, it's June 20x8. But uh, it's quite a time pressure. It's, uh, okay, it's, time quite, it's, it's, it's quite a time pressure, isn't it? So uh, we need to consider that whether or not we have sufficient resources to conduct the audit as a result to meet with the client's needs. Now I see a company background. The Medis company manufactures surgical instruments so sold to hospitals and clinics. Cl clinics would be the small hospitals, in other words. Due to increased use of laser surgery in the last four years, Demand for traditional metal surgical instruments accounted for 75% of revenue has declined rapidly. So it seems that the internal issues of a client's company is that the operations of the business will not be particularly good. Oh, I would say that the, um, the demand for product will not be particularly great. So we need to care about its cash flows, perhaps. Okay. So, because from a practical point of view, whether or not you've got money to pay the audit fees, and that'll be very, very important there. Medis Complex is expanding into the provision of laser surgery equipment, but the R&D is at an early stage. Okay, there'll be a risk for that. The risk, for example, the risk of material misstatement, where or not the client would capitalise the development cost, even though it's at an early stage. Because the R&D will be at the early stage, and therefore we need to put all the R&D expenditure into the PL as the expense, rather than to capitalising them as the intangible asset. The directors feel confident that the laser instruments are currently being designed, and will eventually receive the necessary licence for commercial production, and that the laser products will replace the surgical instruments as a leading source of revenue. Okay, so uh, it's quite good. And if you can successfully develop that product, and that would be good for business, it seems that there's currently one scientist working on the laser equipment, so con contracted by Medis Company on a freelance basis. So it seems that quite a bit risky here. Because the scientists, may leave the business, may leave the clients, taking up all of the knowledge, especially for the R&D uh, project, information to its direct competitors. So if this is the case there, it will waste the client's company lots of cash. So that would be quite risky for a client's company, so we need to consider the internal issues related to that. So if we accept as an auditor, but subsequently the scientist left the business, uh, taking all the information out from the business and therefore the business will suffer quite a lot of cash flows problems as a result perhaps. The building in which the research is being carried out has recently been significantly extended by construction of a large laboratory, okay, a large piece of PPNA, and that's fine there. A considerable revenue stream is derived from agents who are not employed by the client. The agent earned commission based on the value of sales that they secured for Medis company during the year. There are many supplies in the market and agents are used by all manufacturers as a means of marketing 
are distributing their product. So it seems that quite lots of revenue deriving from the agent. What well, if the agents are not working with the client's company? And that would be another risk that we need to consider. The company's manufacturing facility is located in other country where operating costs are significantly lower. That's quite good for profit for a client. The facility is under the control of local manager who visits the head office annually for a meeting with the senior management and products are imported by airplane. The overseas plant equipment is owned by the company and was constructed 12 years ago specifically for the instrument. And that could be fine, okay? So you locate your manufacturing facilities overseas to lower your cost base and that's a good strategy. The company has a bank overdraft facility and make use of a facility most months. Okay, it seems that you use most of the, uh, uh, you use the facility and therefore there will be significant co-liabilities in your account. So where not your cash flows, again, we've got some, uh, uh, got some problems and we need to consider that. A significant bank loan carrying a variable interest rate so variable interest rates, in, in, in other words, the interest rate, if I were to borrow some money from the bank, so each and every month, perhaps we're going to pay different interest rate according to the market interest rate changes. So in practical terms, that would be benchmarked against, for example, the interbank offer rate. So for example, if you're living in the UK, that would be the London interbank offer rate, or the LIBOR for short. And of course, if you're living in the EU, and of course, it will be the European uh, like, uh, 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 interbank offer rate. Okay? So if you are living in China, for example, that would be a Shanghai interbank offer rate, or we can call it as the Shibor rate. So the variable interest rate will be benchmarked against the interbank offer rates that will be updated each and every day. It's currently being negotiated. Okay? So what if the significant bank loan cannot be applied by the client's company will certainly be, again, the cash flows problems that we can comment on. The terms of the loan will be finalised once the audited financial statement has been reviewed by the bank. So it seems that if the audited financial statement are not available, the significant bank loan will not be applied. And that's why it may give us a bit pressure okay, when we are checking the financial statements of a client's company. Uh, so if um, the financial statements audited, I mean, reflected in the audit report, and uh, saying that the financial statements contain material misstatements, and subsequently we issue the qualified audit opinion, the client's company would then reject to pay us for the fees. And that would be a significant self-interest threat to objectivity that we need to consider before we accept as an auditor. Let's see the exhibits number two then. What sort of things that we can comment, bringing to our answer. Medis company has been audit clients for three years and we took over from the previous auditor following a disagreement between them and the directors of Medis company over fees. Okay, so in, 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 other, in other words, uh, it's like the uh, fees or the cash flows problems, perhaps, I, I'm not particularly sure, or perhaps because of the overdue fees, the fees that owed to the audit, auditor are not paid by the client. We're not particularly sure, but uh, some complex problems may have arisen, I, yeah, that we need to consider that very carefully. As we are a small practice with low overhead, we could offer lower fees than our predecessors. Yeah, predecessors means the previous auditor. Okay, we can offer lower fees. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, it's like the low balling, which means offering a discount, something like that. We can also do the audit very quickly. Ooh, so what do we mean by very quickly? Of course, if you were to allocate more resources in doing the work, and that could be absolutely fine. But if you were to reduce your audit scope and not comp complying with what your audit engagement says, um, this is absolutely not allowed to reduce your audit quality because it will increase your audit risk, i.e. the risk 
of giving a wrong audio opinion on the client's financial statements instead. Okay, so very quickly is to please the client because they want to keep the cost as low as possible. So it seems that this is not particularly good for the previous auditor because we are uh, assessing the comment by Mick. Mick will be uh, the current auditor, but it's about to leave the client. And Mick took over from Mick's predecessor auditor to be a current auditor. And we are considering to replace Mick. Okay, so that's the relationship of that. So it seems that Mick commented that the clients may have certain issues. So in particular, the opinion shopping. So uh, whether or not is because that the um, the make uh, yeah make uh, decide to qualify the audio opinion uh, on the kinds financial statements and therefore the kinds find us or come to us uh, for a second opinion. We're not particularly sure, but bear this in mind before you accept as an auditor. If the kinds want a second opinion and we accept as an auditor, we are breaking the principle of competence according to the ACCA Code of Ethics. Okay, I hope you can remember that. During our audit, we found out that the internal controls to be quite weak. Okay, so in other words, that would affect our <coughs> audit approach and the fees charge as well, because if their control system is quite weak, and therefore, we may need to use the full substantive test approach. If I were to use the full substantive test approach, and this would certainly be an increasing uh, cost for us, and therefore we charge a higher fee. But it seems that clients decide to pay as low as possible for the audit fees, and whether or not they can afford the fees, and they are willing to pay the fees, and this would be questionable. Despite our recommendations, there will always be a lack of interest in making improvements to the accounting system as this was seen to be a waste of money. There have been two investigations by tax authorities uh, which we did not deal with because we are not tax experts, commented by Mick. In the end, directors sorted it all out and I believe that tax matter is now resolved. So it seems that the reputation may not be particularly good. Okay. So in other words, their accounting system quite weak and when we accept as a new coming auditor for the client's complete later on it may have similar issues related to taxes. So uh, we need to consider potential advocacy threats to objectivity as well. So uh, we have to make sure that we are not going to be involving uh, in the in dealing with the tax matters faced by the client's company. So, for example, we are not representing them uh, when resolving the dispute between the client and the tax authorities. Because that's very important there. So bear that in mind. The advocacy threats to objectivity need to be avoided. We never had a problem getting access to accounting books and records. So, in other words, the precondition is met. Because precondition in the engagement letter, first of all, the client is responsible for provi providing the financial statement, preparing for financial statement. Second, they need to ensure the internal control systems are effective. But third, they give the right to auditors to get access to all the books and entries and records for auditing purposes. It seems that would be fine. However, the managing director once gave us what he described as wrong cash book by mistake. So cash book will be quite, uh, I would say, uh, it's quite special and quite important in any businesses because uh, if I was to have lots of journal entries, but uh, in the end, it will come to cash, right? Okay, so for example, he decides to order inventories from the supplier you're going to record the accounts payable, but subsequently you need to convert them into cash, which means the cash payment to reduce that liability, to reduce the 
liability owed to the supplier. So um, wrong cash book. So it, it seems to me that uh, the client or the managing director keeps two cash book and one is for the business use, but one is for the real use. So in other words, he's do taking cash from a company into his own pocket. So perhaps some of the fraudulent transactions may have arisen in the first place. Or sometimes for a cash book, so receiving cash, not recording this, in presenting that to the auditor in the, for example, the cash book number one, but the actual cash receipt in the cash book number two, that may imply the fact there will be risk of money laundering activities in some way, because we are not particularly sure the source of cash they're receiving and so on, or perhaps the payments of cash to the overseas companies, so we're not particularly sure for that. So there will be risk of either fraud or the money laundering, or we can call it ML for short. I replace it with the proper version of later in the day. We never found out why he was keeping two cash book, but cash was an immaterial asset, so we didn't worry about it too much. And therefore, we need to consider the opening balance of their financial statement very carefully. If I were to accept as the new auditor to check the client's company's account, because it seems that Mick hasn't done lots of work for the important element at all. And that's why the audit quality seems that would be quite low. And if I were to replace Mick to be as a new auditor for this particular company, we will need to devote more time and effort in checking the opening balance of the file system very carefully. We are resigning as auditor because Mick will be resigning as the auditor because the workload is too much for our small practice. Yes, the, the uh, explanation is, is, is okay. And as Medis Company is our only audit clients we have decided to focus on providing non-audit services in the future, that's absolutely fine though. So uh, it seems that would be fine, but uh, it seems that uh, we need to consider these factors, for example, the risks and cash flows and PD and shopping, uh, not because of opinion shopping issues, but opening balances, work, uh, and preconditions, and the risks of fraud and money laundering before we finally are set as an auditor. So let's see the final exhibit for this. is the extract from local newspaper. So it says it appears that local company called Medis Company, it's a client, potential client, have breached the local planning regulations by building an extension to its research and development building for which no local authority approval has been given. The land on which the, uh, the, land on which the premises is situated has protected status as the greenfield side, which means that approval from the local authorities is needed for any modifications to a building. So in other words, it's not getting approval from the government to build an extension on top of that building. So breaking the laws and regulations as a result. And of course, uh, according to the ISA, we, as an auditor, we have the secondary responsibility as a result of it in detecting this and to uh, require management or to communicate with management and to uh, ask them to, to correct that mistake or to paying the penalties, paying the fines imposed by the government and so on. So it seems that later on, if I were to accept as an auditor, there will be a lot more work to be communicated uh, to the client's company. So it would certainly affect our time spent. That's very important that we need to consider that. Um, and also we can care about the reputation of a client's company as well. A representative of the, of, of the local planning office stated today, we feel that this is a series of breach of regulations. It's not the first time, okay, it's not the first time that Medis Company deliberately ignored the planning rules 
And therefore, we need to consider the reputation involved as well. The company was successfully sued in 20X3, which means a few years ago, for constructing an access road without receiving planning permission. We are now considering taking legal action. In respect of this further breach of planning regulations, we are taking steps to ensure that these premises should be shut down within a month. So quite lots of work that we need to communicate with the Medis company. A similar breach of regulations by a different company last year resulted in the demolition of the building. So in other words, if uh, the company is successfully sued in the upcoming period, and that means the company will need to spend a lot of cash to remove that particular extension, and that would certainly be a dream or certainly be a reduction in its cash flow as a result. And whether or not the company can apply the loan from the bank successfully, otherwise, uh, of course, the company may have cash flow problems and in paying for us and may have problems in paying the audit fees and so on. So we need to consider that risk very carefully. So let's see how I put all these things together okay, when answering this question. First of all, I would say I care about the time to build up the knowledge. That's step number one. Step number two then, according to the standard, what we need to do is to reduce the risk of material misstatement so we can reduce the, uh, I mean the audit risk, for example the risk of giving a wrong audit opinion by making sure that we understand the client's entity in a bit uh, more detail. The uh, implications or reasons would be uh, the Medis company is a highly regulated industry that you operate in. And that's why we need to be very careful into doing that stuff, uh, into accepting as an auditor, because it needs time for us to know its industry. And therefore, the how to do it is to consider potential resources that we have. Okay, so that's the number one time to build up knowledge. Second, we need to consider the expertise involved as well. So for example, the industry will be highly regulated. That's step number one. And according to the standard, of course, uh, from the ethics point of view, we need to be competent. This is important. The reason why this is the case is because, uh, of course, as I said, yeah, we, it affects our audio approach. For example, we are not to engage with the expert in helping us to audit the client's financial statement. Alternatively, to reduce the audit risk. You don't have to say both in your, in your exam, but you can pick up one of that in your exam there. And finally, what we need to do, or how we're going to improve this, uh, would be, for example, uh, where not to engage an expert. into helping us during the audit. That's important there. That's the second one, the expertise, competence and resources. You can use one of the words as your subheading. That could be fine. Next one, we need to consider the internal control system for clients company. So it seems that they have weak systems, especially related to accounting. But um, according to the standards, for example, uh, you can say if you're familiar with the precondition part, uh, the client should ensure good systems in place. So it seems that it's breaching one of the 
preconditions, requirements in the precondition part according to the ISA 210, and therefore uh, we need to question about that. So, in other words, the implications for this would be to change our audit approach. So, in other words, we may need to use the full substantive test as a result. So in other words, we're going to be checking more source document and to matching the source document with the accounting record, for example, in the elements in the financial statement later on. So we're going to be checking quite a lot of detailed transactions here rather than just simply going through its internal control system to get authorization, checking for signatures and so on. But here, we need to do more work, we need to devote more time, and certainly uh, more audit fees need to be charged as a result. So how are we going to improve it? Or perhaps the next point we're going to write would be other considerations for the control system. So we need to see where not more staff will be allocated. Therefore, the increase or the fees charged as a result. That's, that's important consideration, so we need to consider that. We also care about the opening balances of the current financial statement, so uh, it seems that the opening balance is this step number one high risk of fraud. It's the high fraud risk. So why this is the case is because the uh, MIC as the current audit partner is not doing uh, enough work in checking the balances, okay, per the per the case study. And according to ISA, this is a requirement, we will see that ISA later on to check all those opening balances very carefully. And the implications for that, of course, is the professional clearance. Uh, that the, we are talking with the uh, predecessor auditor, or the previous auditor called Meek, about this particular issue, and we find out the opening balances may contain lots of material statement there. So therefore, what we should do, as a step number four, is to make sure professional scepticism should be raised when we are auditing the company's financial statements later on if we accept as an auditor. But it seems that we don't accept as an auditor because that, there are lots of risks related to that, uh, related to this industry or related to this company. And also you can see the management style. So for example, I will use color red, for example. Uh, is sued for unfair dismissal. That would be the step number one, bring the case information. So according to the standard, what we should do, there will be no particular standards for that, but according to our business understanding, the good working relationship uh, may not be established between us and the client's company, and therefore, it may increase complexity when we are chasing money back from the client's company as an implication in step number three, and therefore, we need to take more care before we accept as an auditor. The next point will be the free the, the, the fee pressure as well. So it seems that the client's company decide to have a tight control on costs as the step number one. And make sure that, of course, low balling is allowed, but if they want us to reduce the audit scope in order to save costs, and this is absolutely not allowed, okay? So, uh, what we need to do as a step number two there is that the, uh, the 
clients should not limit on our scope or be one of an other preconditions that we need to consider according to the ISA 210. And the uh, implications for this would be to consider cut flows problems potentially uh, within the client and there will be quite a lot of supported evidence for that, so for example, using up the uh, overdraft facility for most months and also applying for a significant bank loan, which may not be successful. And how we should do it, we should only take clients with a good credit rating, okay, otherwise we may be in trouble. We also need to consider its reputation as well, so for example, in a local press, the reputation is not very good, and damaging the public interest, for example, and also it's an example of no car, uh, which means non-compliance with laws and regulations by a client's company, and we've got secondary responsibility, and we can put that as a step number two there. And uh, if we work as an auditor for this particular client, it will affect our reputation as a result, and therefore, more care to be taken okay, regarding this matter. So, reputation part, four steps approach. We also consider the advocacy threats to objectivity uh, because to deal with the tax matter in the past, but uh, we can't be compromised in dealing with the uh, tax matter in, uh, potentially uh, for the audit client in front of the tax authorities because that would be advocacy threats to objectivity. And uh, we need to avoid that, okay, as implication and how we should do it. Avoid taking on a new client, okay, if they still got the ongoing investigation. But here, clearly, it's not the case because the tax matter, tax investigation has been resolved. But unluckily, the party may be suing the client's company for the breach of local laws and regulations. So we may be presenting this or representing our clients in, in, potentially, but we should avoid that. Okay, so that's very important though. We also consider the integrity of the management as well, especially for the managing director, because having perhaps, uh, according to the standard, if they are involved in illegal activities, so for example, the money laundering activities or the potential tax evasion activities so that they have different cash book, for example, so we should reject as an auditor. So uh, if it is owner managed and payment to the overseas operations, this will increase the likelihood of money laundering activities and therefore, if we accept as an auditor, first of all, before that, we need to obtain further details okay, about these payments and so on before we accept as an auditor, otherwise we will not accept as an auditor to your firm, oh, to, your, to your company, sorry. And finally, we also need to consider the risk of material misstatement as well, so because they want to secure bank finance, they may uh, overstate a few things, especially for the current ratios, as well as the profit and cash flows in this business. And therefore, we will see that the risk of material misstatement of a client's company will be quite high and the implications for that would be to uh, allocate more staff and so on to audit this company but whether or not our benefit would justify the increase in costs and therefore if I were to accept as an auditor proper audit planning should be very careful to increase the extent on, on the level of professional scepticism during the audit. So it seems that it's not wise to, to, to be as an auditor for the medics company for such high risky company and therefore rejecting as an auditor would be quite good. So the conclusion is worth at one mark for that. But you don't really have to give such conclusion here, so for example, reject as an auditor, but you can accept as an auditor, but make sure that the audit quality uh, standard is adhered to as a result. I've given you lots of points here, but you don't have to write them all in the exam. So if I were you, I'll pick up six, okay, maximum of seven, but six points will be absolutely enough to pass this requirement. Very good question here. The next case study will be looking at the Newman and Co. Very similar question, 12 marks, and 
identify values that must to be considered in evaluating the invitation to perform an assurance engagement on the sustainability report of the Eastwood PLC. So here we are considering where not we should accept as the assurance provider on the sustainability report. So sustainability report is different from the financial statement, but it's, it's saying that where not it damages the environment and the contribution to its environment and also the impact on the society in terms of the, for example, the amount of money that you've donated to society and so on. So these are all about sustainability. So we're going to check that report. So you are a manager of the global firm of charter certified accountants evaluating proposed engagement and for recommending a team of partners where not the engagement should be accepted. And Eastwood's PLC is an existing audit client and we are now providing perhaps the known audit services. And it's an international service uh, operator with a global network including 220 countries and 300,000 employees, so quite a large company uh, indeed. The company offers mail and freight services to individuals and corporate customers, as well as storage and logistical services. Okay, that's fine now. So Eastwood's PLC takes its CSR seriously and publishes the social environmental KPIs in a sustainability report. Okay. So therefore, we're going to check that. So whether or not we should accept as the assurance provider for this, which is published with the financial statement in the annual report. So partly in response to requests from shareholders and pressure groups, the PLC's management decided that in the forthcoming annual report, the KPI should be accompanied by independent assurance report. So it seems that, I'm going to consider that, an approach has been made uh, to your firm. Okay, so they approach us. So let's see the exhibit number one there. The note with the meeting are from the meeting with the audit manager, it's called Ali. So Newsman and Co. has audited the PLC for three years. It's a major audit client for our firm due to its global presence and recent listing on two major stock exchanges. Yeah, that's fine there. And it's quite a large complaint. The audit is managed from our office in Old Town, which is also the location of the global headquarters of Eastwood PLC. Okay. We've not done any work on the KPIs other than review them for consistency. So we're not, we've got experience of doing that work because if we don't do the work on a correct basis, they may uh, not pay us for the fees and in order to secure that fee, perhaps we will give a wrong audit opinion in the audit report instead. That would certainly be increasing that threat to objectivity to an unacceptable level if we don't have knowledge and experience and so on and any safeguard in providing that particular non-audit work. As we will, as we will with any other information issued in a financial statement, uh, so we're going to check them. The KPIs are produced by the PLCs, or the, or the kind sustainability department, located in far town, okay, so it's quite a different city. We have not visited the kind offices in far town, as it is in a remote location overseas, and the department's base uh, there are not relevant to audit at all. So, in other words, whether or not we've got resources, to check this information in person. That's very important there. So if you can't go in that particular place, overseas country, don't have resources in doing that at all, you cannot guarantee the results are correct in some way. We've performed the audit procedures on charitable donations, as this is disclosed in the notes, and our evidence indicates there have been donations of £9 million this year, which the amount is closed in the notes, but the draft KPI is a different figure. Okay, so in the financial statements is 9, but in the actual calculation, KPI is 10.5. So we need to see the actual calculations, so we need to re-perform that later on. So there will be quite lots of work, and we need to ensure that we've got the correct methodologies to, to calculate this and to confirm its accuracy. 
But if this is not the case there, of course, that will result in some problems. And this is the figure highlighted in the draft uh, chairman statement, as well as the draft sustainability report of 10.5. Uh, perhaps 10.5 is not correct, and um, this should be removed from this report. £9 million is material to the financial statement. Okay, so we need to see that if the £9 million is not correct, of course, it will, uh, uh, if 10.5 is not correct, it should be 9, so of course, it will qualify the or the opinion later on, okay, because uh, of this matter, okay, or of the material inconsistency between the financial and non-financial part. Uh, to modify the audit report. Okay, so the audit work is nearly complete and the annual report is to be published in about four weeks in time for the company meeting. So whether or not we still got time to build up knowledge in this field, we need to consider that. So here I'm going to uh, approximately write about uh, six points, something like that. Okay, so we're talking about the requirements by our clients and time pressure, and whether or not we are competent, and the risks involved, and the fees charged, and the objectivity. Uh, so these are the things that we're going to be covering. So first of all, we're going to be seeing the uh, requirements uh, by the by client's entity. So for example, the level of work expected, which means, in other words, is the assurance requires whether or not there will be reasonable or negative assurance. Negative assurance, we are going to present our findings, perhaps. And the conscious standard, of course, this will certainly impact on the workload, uh, and we're going to see the implications for that. May require specific procedures uh, for the KPIs with a high level of assurance, because it will affect the financial statement in the other report instead. So what we need to improve we need to further care about is the expected form and the wording of the report. Okay, so that's how we structure paragraphs like this. And second, it seems that the step number one, publishing four weeks, whether or not we have resources in do that, do, doing that. Uh, because to complete the assignment, given that we haven't got experience in that particular field, we may need more time. It cannot sacrifice the quality, for example. So what we need to do, uh, we may need to clarify uh, with the management whether or not they intend to publish the assurance report alongside with the uh, annual report. We need to make sure that uh, this would be agreed and the level of assurance and given the time pressure on the audit firm or perhaps the separate audit report, and that's very important there, uh, because if that's for a separate report, may need more time to be conducting our procedures. So, uh, so this is the step number four there. Okay, so this is the one per the standard and the implications and how. Okay, that's it. How about for competence? Okay, so uh, it seems that. The department's been recently established in our audit firm, that's the step number one. According to standard, we need to be competent, otherwise we will face lots of issues of chasing money, but to give a wrong audit opinion instead in the client's audit report. It seems that the KPI is quite specialised in nature and need expertise, and therefore we may think about the bringing expertise and to supplement our two. Uh, supplement our competence in doing this work. It seems that the risk is quite high because it has been listed in two stock exchange, okay, so bring that as a step number one there. And also, the KPI report uh, would be available perhaps to a lot of pressure groups and therefore it's like the public interest stuff. And therefore, uh, there will be quite a lot of users on the sustainability report and, uh, and, and perhaps for the audit firm we may limit our liability. So for example we may be putting a disclaimer paragraph clarifying the intended user of such reports to reduce our risk. So risk would be a major consideration here. 
And also it seems that it should be the fees charge and uh, quite a large fees charge perhaps for the large companies such as this. And we need to ensure that according to the standard we can't lower our costs, uh, sacrificing our quality instead, but to make sure the fees can cover the costs that we incur. That's important there. So we need to negotiate the fees as a step number three with the clients very carefully related to that particular matter. Okay. So I'm going to bring the step two and step three all together because the step two say what standard says we cannot simply have excessive costs over the fees uh, from a commercial perspective. Uh, the implication for that would be uh, the low quality work if we are charging too low fees. The objectivity issues that we need to consider as well, so for example, objectivity we need to consider the step number one as your point, and according to standard, reduce that to an acceptable level, that's the step number two, according to ACCA code of ethics in particular. And the third one, because it's our major audit clients, the fee level providing services could breach the permitted level of recurring fees allowed from one client because, as I said before, if your uh, fees from one client is more than 15%, later on you will do additional procedures according to the ACCA Code of Ethics. So, for example, you may need to have a pre-issuance review or the post-issuance review for a second financial statement uh, uh, or the report, for example, uh, and if the fees have already accounted for more than 15%, you cannot accept any other non-audit work to increase the amount of revenue from that particular client. So you need to bear that in mind, and that would be the ethical requirement. So it seems that, because it's a listed company, so it's important to assess its objectivity, and therefore, the second partner review of the objectivity may be considered. So, for example, you can say uh, the pre issuance review uh, may need to be done, or perhaps an option would be the post issuance review okay, from the ethics point of view. So, these are the considerations before uh, you accept as the uh, provider, assurance provider, which means assurance, which means confidence, so it, depending on whether or not that would be related to audits, that would be positive assurance, uh, or non-audit work, that would be negative assurance, presenting your findings, presenting your report, uh, but not in opinion. Uh, so, uh, before you accept as the assurance provider, you need to consider these factors, okay? So, make sure that each paragraph includes, for example, here, four steps on, make sure that you closely link your answer with the case information to bring you marks in the exam. You can't simply say, we need time, uh, we are afraid of a time pressure, full stop. You are likely to get no marks from that or a maximum of 0.5. But make sure four steps are there and you can be a winner in this particular examination. And I'm going to stop this recording now, and I hope you find this section very useful to your exam, and I look forward to seeing you in the next section then, and happy studying, bye for now. A, P, C, accounting for your future.